don't know Welcome to the behavior panel. Now we're going to take a look at the best of behavior tactics when it comes to body language and our videos. So, uh, Chase, why don't you go first on this one? What do you think? I think if you were uh, an awesome parent, an awesome salesperson, an awesome leader, an awesome negotiator, an awesome fill in the blank, that means that you're really good at human skills. And that's really what we're going to cover here in this is how to see what other people can't and how to hear what other people really don't. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Greg? Yeah. So if you pay attention to what we're covering in this episode, what you're going to see are skills from our past, things that we've picked up from our past. And we come from four different directions. So you get a lot of new tools, a lot of things that are in a very condensed episode that come from other places. I think you'll find this very valuable. Hopefully you, you agree. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So look, um, you can get everything that we're talking about, you might think, from reading tons and tons and tons and tons of books. We've read a ton, we've written a ton as well, but really in our videos here, we start to take what is the best in the world of the ideas and the tactics that we've read and we've used ourselves in real life situations we've kind of upgraded them as well to make them even more useful and there is only really one way to get them which is straight from our mouth so we hope you really enjoy this kind of live training from us today scott what do you got i'm supposed to follow you <laughs> on something like that okay i'm out that's let's just, let's just watch well, today's going to be a little bit different than what we usually do. We're not going to analyze anybody. But we're going to start telling you how we analyze people because the debates are coming up. And so that's going to be fairly interesting. And if you're trying to figure out uh, what's happening, what you're seeing, we're going to help you do that. We're going to sort of break down what we look for so you'll know what you can look for to make decisions about what you think is happening or how it looks to you. Because we're telling you what, how things look to us. You're going to be able to say, here's the way it looks to me and feel confident about that with your uh, answer or your suggestion, or your idea because of the information we're gonna give you. So Greg, why don't you start with explaining how we're gonna go about doing this? Yeah, so today we're gonna to start by talking to you about some basics. And everyone will use a little bit different language and each of us will add some nuance to this whole thing, but we'll start by giving you five categories of body language that we look for. These are not absolutes, this is just boxes to put information into. I usually use a hand because you've got two of them and you carry it around to remember this by. Number one's a gesture. You see me putting my thumb up. In the US that means something very specific. That means something very specific. A gesture means that you have to understand it. You can't suddenly just make up your own gesture or you look crazy and that kind of thing doesn't work. So to be able to communicate, it needs to be universally understood. Americans are really bad at leaving the country and thinking that's universally understood when it's not. Culture plays a huge part in the gesture. The second one is an illustrator. You hear us talking about illustrators punctuating your brain's thought. And we call this batoning, and I think that's probably Desmond Morris who coined the phrase, but Hitler did this. People do that. They baton, they're whipping you. Bill Clinton, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. It's a way of illustrating what your brain is thinking. Simply that. It's a category. You're looking for ways to illustrate. You may use your forehead. You may use your hands. You may use a, a device. Uh, Khrushchev with a shoe, clearly a great one. So there's gestures, illustrators. The next, and I'll be a little rude here, is a regulator. That's the way you control conversation. You'll remember that because it's in the middle of your hand and it's a way to control conversation. Other ways can be this, depending on where you're at in the world, not a good choice. It can be touching someone. Some people are more tactile than others. It can be covering your mouth to control conversation with another person. It can be any of that. So that's gestures, illustrators, regulators. Next is an adapter. And I use the ring finger an adapter is something that you use to make the uncomfortable comfortable. If I lock you in a cage, you'll play with your ring. Coyotes pace in a cage when they're locked in. It's a way of making the unknown comfortable, and it's a powerful tool. Then finally, the last of the five is a barrier. And I use all my hands together to show you barrier. It means I need space. And you'll see that in all kinds of people. And the barrier can be powerful when combined with an illustrator. I call that sacred space when you create space and make yourself comfortable. That's all there is to it, guys. We'll take this as the basics, and there's your category. Yes, that's really all I needed. Sorry, don't roll the tape yet. <laughs> Jody, how did you know? I don't think that. Was the relationship ever violent? Um, pass on that question. <laughs> all right, Chase, what do you got? I think no matter what, if we were to just distill body language down, 
into ridiculous simple levels to where I could write a body language book on a post-it note. It would be the body's either closing or opening. That's that's bigger it. than a post-it note, though. <laughs> but that's it. The body's either closing or opening, and we can look at it through that lens, especially in the beginning. If I'm teaching you body language and, and you're at home, you got to interview a babysitter, you got to interview somebody who's going to watch your kids or somebody at work, it, the first piece of advice I'd give you is to watch if the body is getting closer together or opening back up. And we see some of that in here, but before that, we see this this makeup scene where she's doing her makeup. And I think that really illustrates some of the personality we're talking about with this personality disorder that she may or may not have of just this addiction to the limelight, attention, affection, and a feeling of some kind of importance. And I'll give you one thing to, to as just a parting note here that the mask that a person wears is usually the opposite of whatever they're most ashamed of from childhood. Were you aware that Jordan Chandler or his family on his behalf filed a litigation, a lawsuit against you? Yes. Okay. Were you aware at, that at some point in time in that lawsuit, Adrian McManus gave her deposition Positive. Your answer confuses me. Uh, how do you mean you're not positive? You don't know whether she gave her deposition or not. Exactly. Yeah, so a breathing rate is right up, double what it should be, I think, at, at resting. The way I read breathing rate is just to look for that kind of area of a collar, usually a button, something like that. And you'll just see it move, even in low quality video like this. Look at that area and you can see it going up and down. You can read the breathing rate really, really easily. You can, and, and all you need to do is just breathe along to it and see how you feel. Because how you're feeling is going to be indicative of how he's feeling. There are some things which are very, very similar in every human being. Your levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to have an effect on your endocrine system. That's going to shoot off some neurotransmitters in your brain, and you'll get a feeling immediately around this. John 911, where's your emergency? Oh, 1810 Cedar Street, please. What's wrong? My wife's had an accident. She's still breathing. What kind of accident? She's still on the stairs. She's still breathing. Please come. Is she conscious? What? Is she no. conscious? No, she's not conscious. Okay. Please. How many stairs did you what? fall down? Huh? How many stairs? Stairs. How many stairs? Calm down, sir. Calm down. No, uh, 15, 20, I don't know. Please, get somebody here right away. Please. Okay, somebody's right dispatching the ambulance no. while I ask you questions. It's a force field, okay? Please, please. This is, uh, th these are the classic signs of someone who probably did what they're calling about. A lot of things are happening here. You wouldn't say, get somebody here. You'd say, send an ambulance. When things like this happen, you call 911, there's been there's a problem and that you are just laser focused on that problem. And when you switch your attention to the 911 call, because you've got to call for help, everything goes to that. The world gets small and you pinpoint on that 911 call and you tell them, I need help right now. You don't say, I need somebody, get somebody here. You say, I need help. You know, and then they start asking you what happened. You may say, my some somebody did this, but the first thing you're focused on is getting help. He, so he's acting like the call is a secondary event in this. And you would think logically from a logical standpoint, that would make sense. There's a body, I've got to deal with this, or somebody's hurt, I've got to deal with this, and then make the 911 call. No, because your brain doesn't work that way. When your brain fires off, your limbic system fires off, and you get into fight or flight, which, he's, which you're supposed to be in during this, you, again, laser focus on that call and getting help to that person. That's all you're thinking about. So that's what you're repeating. And he's doing what we call in the True Crime Workshop, that's insulating. He's 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 so caught up with what's going on. He's insulating himself from any questions. He says, "What? I can't. I don't know." To get somebody here quickly, he's insulating himself from what's going on from the uh, dispatcher by make by having all these emotional things that are, that that he thinks he's supposed to show while he does this. Some calls when the person didn't do it, they're actually asking for help. There's almost no emotion at all in those because they're. Their, their emotions drop. They're just, just straight ahead, almost talking like they're a robot. So in, the, in this case, that's not what's happening. It does happen in other cases where they, they are 
uh, really um, dramatic and they sound dramatic and it's true and it's real and they do need help, but they will not talk like this guy just talked. And another thing is after watch, after listening to this, where's the mystery in this? There's no, once you hear this, you should know automatically from, from law enforcement standpoint, this is your guy right there. There's no question about it. That's why we're also focused on this as we go through. If they asked you to take a polygraph, would you? Would you not? And why? No, I got nothing to hide. They want me to, but I don't care. I'm just at home, work up there all day. I barely go anywhere. Once in a while, I go to Manitowoc and come back. And that's about it. So, so when you heard about it. If you go and purchase a book on interrogation, it'll most likely be something called the Reed Technique. And one of those first steps that they, first little secret steps they teach you are two questions. Would you take a polygraph? Or did they ask you to take a polygraph? Would you take a polygraph? And the, the secret follow-up to that is, well, I mean, if you wouldn't take it, how do you think you would do on a polygraph? And we ask how, we ask them to estimate how they would do on a polygraph. So she's doing some really good stuff here. But I'll tell you one more secret that you won't hear many body language experts say. There is no such thing as deceptive behavior. There is no human behavior that shows that it's deceptive. What we're looking for is stress and disagreement between words and body. And we're reading words. Some things are more likely to be deceptive, but the behavior is not. Yeah, I, I think that's a great catch. And what I would say is this, when I say this indicates deception, it doesn't mean that this, if I do this, it means you're deceiving somebody because some people do that all the time and it means right. nothing, but it, I say it, it too. Right. Yeah. I, and you just, one of the things for people to get is deception also doesn't mean lying. Deception can be all kinds of things. It simply turns us to think to your point that, if you think about a polygraph, the thing we all think, yeah, 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 whatever, they're measuring three channels. We're measuring many channels. We're just looking for deviation. That's all it, we're looking for. Exactly. That's why we always say it denotes, it suggests, it indicates deception. Not like that means deception. That's an absolutist. You'll hear people say, I'm not an absolutist, but they'll tell you that there is on, yeah, it's being deceptive. I've seen people do that stuff on the news. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. And it's, uh Anyway, so that's one of my, uh, the whole TEDx talk on that. That's one of and my soapbox. I'll throw a, a little piece of research in here. I think the researcher was Rossi, R-O-S-S-I. If two people like each other and they're in trust and rapport, the average contact, eye contact in westernized countries is seven seconds before it breaks. But if you don't like someone or you're not very well acquainted like him and this other person, it's around four and a half. So I think, Greg, you're spot on with that research. Excellent. One of the ways I remember it starting is, um, you know, Michael just sort of starting to touch my legs and touch my crotch over my pants. It progressed to him performing oral sex on me, him showing me how to perform oral sex on him. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so here's what I got. I got um, actually quite a lot of downward intonation uh, here. So uh, I talk about intonation quite a bit. You got downward intonation, you got straight intonation, you got upward intonation, just as a generalized model. Downward intonation tends to be more secure, more certain. Upward intonation tends to be a question, and straight into intonation tends to be uh, just you know, a, a fact, a statement. We're getting downward intonation here. So there's there's certainty. We will get some upward intonation uh, coming here uh, later on, uh, but we get looks for uh, approval when the acts escalate. So there's no looks for approval on just the, the touching, but when the sexual acts come in, there's more looks for approval and some slight upward intonation on, I think, the word uh, him. Um, yeah, that's all I've got on, on that one. There we go. So one of the things that I think is really important for you to look at is going to be blink rate and how often this happens. So what we're talking about with blink rate specifically is how often a person is blinking the average times that human beings blink every minute is around 12, somewhere around 12. And 
if we see an increase in how often someone is blinking, we're seeing an increase in stress. Almost universally, with a few exceptions, one of those being maybe allergy season. We see a decrease in blink rate when we see someone get more focused and more comfortable on the stage. So if you're watching these debates or watching any conversation and you hear someone just talk about taxes or IRS and you see blink rate go up in the other person, that's an indicator that you're seeing some kind of a stress response. So the last time you were really stressed out, your blink rate can go all the way up to like a 90 to 100. And the last time you watched a movie that was really, that just captured all of your attention, your blink rate might have been around a five or a four sometimes. So the more interested and focused we are, the less often we are going to be blinking in a conversation. We get stressed out. If a topic or something that's being spoken about stresses us out, you'll see the blink rate go up. So one thing to look for is not just, oh, their blink rate's fast or it's slow. What we're looking for are changes. We want to note, is it increasing or decreasing, not fast or slow? So much body language books and articles will give you these still images. And, and that makes us think I need to look for these still image shots. But what we're looking for is movement and change. Wherever we're watching nonverbal communication, we're looking for movement and change. So I saw the blink rate go up and my head's automatically going to go right before that. The guy who's asking the questions said riots. And I know that's a sensitive subject for that person. I saw those blink, those eyes start blinking more, more often. And I'll pass it off to Scott. All right. When it comes to blinking and, and, and um, eye behavior, one of the things I look for is when someone says something, you see an eye flutter. Sometimes it's a flutter. Sometimes their eyes and uh, Chase refers to it as shutter speed, which I think is brilliant. I think that's awesome. I never thought of it that way. It's, it's almost like they're using their eyelids as a barrier or almost as what we call eye blocking. For example, if, if you tell someone a joke in, in, at work and you know it's the, you know, you've heard the joke before and somebody else is telling it, let's say, and you know that the end is coming and it's not going to be clean at the end and you may start doing the, you may do this or a couple other people that know what the joke is as well. They may start blocking their eyes as well. Did you ever hit her? Did you ever injure her? No, no, my God, no. Um, violence towards women and is, uh, unapproachable. It is the most disgusting act to me. Um, and I know that uh, suspicion has turned to me. And it's, um, it's turned to me, one, because I'm her husband. And that's a natural thing. And I've heard all the statistics on all the news shows about that being, you know, someone that uh, a husband, ex-husband, a boyfriend, that is statistically one who would be responsible for her disappearance. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. As, as he's going through this, as he's feigning this emotional um, horror that he's going through, this, this horrible emotional feeling he's going through, he looks away and it, he's looking away to give her permission to look at him and to observe, quote unquote, his pain and, and, and what he's going through. That's what he's doing there. I don't have a name for it. I'm sure by the time this is over, Jay, uh, Chase will squirt one out. But uh, as far as that goes, I don't have a name for it. But that's what that's what's one. happening at that point. Uh, what do you, what do you, Chase? What do you got? Mask <laughs> display. Mask display. That's a good one. I think yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's a good one, but it's it's uh, close it's up included with eye aversion or gaze aversion. Yeah, I think that's yeah, included. Too. It is. It is, yeah, and Greg's right with that with, when you when you're drawn that way. But the sole purpose of doing this is just to let her observe him going through this pain. There's that. So well, it's, fe it's feigned it. emotional display is all it is, right? It's, yeah, yeah. It's all it is. Yep. yep. F -E -D. Well, I, tra I train some clients to feigned. give a moment for viewers to see them without being seen. So just a, a move away, you know do something somewhere else, just so that you can be observed without you observing the observer. It causes the observer of you to feel more confident in how they're feeling about you. Because you know you didn't notice that they were looking at that point. So you can't have been putting on a mask at that point because like, you, you were just checking something else out. So they, they, they feel like they've seen the authentic 
you because you were messing about with something else. There you go. Well, if you watch movies, actors do it all the time. And I think we are conditioned by movies to think that's how people respond to move and act. And when you see a really bad movie and they don't do that and they're doing all their emotion in front of you and it looks like a really horrible mask, I think that's why people instinctively think that's how people normally look, even if we know it's not true. I witnessed um, Travis being attacked by two other individuals. Who? I don't know who they were. I couldn't pick them out in a police lineup. So what happened? Um, they came into his home and attacked us both. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think the pronouns are important, especially here. There's a book called The Secret Life of Pronouns. It's by Dr. James Pennebaker who really digs into this stuff. I think he's a psychology professor at the University of Texas. She says they came into his house and attacked us. And I witnessed a person attacking. Now let's think about the words she's using. She's saying, I witnessed individuals, not people, not men, not somebody. I witnessed individuals. Travis being attacked by two other individuals. So this is clinical, sterile, vapid, hollow, non-emotional language. And instead of talking about what happened, she's talking about the evidence. I witnessed something happen. I witnessed people attacking him. Not a recalling of what happened in at all, which is a failure to answer the question in the first place. And all of the words and the way she describes anything here, I'll, I'll stay away from behavior for this because you guys probably picked up on a lot. But everything was distant. The language, the pronouns, the descriptors, and even the adjectives that she uses here are distant. Chase, you're dead on. I witnessed Travis being attacked. Passive voice. Not I witnessed him. Not I witnessed murder. I witnessed people killing him. I witnessed this. I witnessed by two individuals. You ever seen the movie, movie Idiocracy, all the really dumb guys call people individuals, particular individuals and that kind of thing? It just made me think of that. Jumped off the plate at me. Real quick, says, Greg, yep. if, if you can finish a sentence with the words by zombies, yeah. then it's passive voice. Yeah, I yeah, witnessed exactly. him being attacked by zombies. by zombies. Great, great call out, guys. That, that's a good one, Chase, as a tool for you. Chase gave you a tool that you can use always to look for passive voice. But passive voice... You, you don't expect that when a person is killed that you care about. Do you still feel controlled by them, the media? Do they still have a hold on you feeling controlled? Um, no, they, they're desperately trying to control the narrative because they know that if they lose it, then the truth will come out. All right, I'll go on first on this one because I got a lot about matching and mirroring. Mark, like what you were just talking about uh, before this. Now, in this, this, is, this shows how Oprah is the master of matching and mirroring. Matching and mirroring is this. You match someone by the words you use and the way your, your approach to, to these sentences you structure when you're talking with someone, you try to match the way they do it. For example, you, you're dealing with either um, something visual, something auditory, or something kinesthetic. That's the three things. You, people say, will talk about the visual things. I see what you say. I, that looks right to me. They'll say something, oh, they'll speak in, like Greg does in, in, in the auditory uh, world. They'll say, that I hear I hear that. Uh, that, that, uh, that shirt's a little bit loud for what she's wearing, don't you think? They'll say things and they'll catch things in terms of sound and kinesthetic. That feels to me like this, or that's a little, he, she's a little rough around the edges, or he's a little rough around the edges, but he'll, he'll come around. That's what that is. And Oprah's doing that with Harry. Now, also to keep it to, to, to go down that road, look at what she's wearing and look at what he's wearing. She's wearing a gray top, dark bottoms. He's wearing a gray top, dark bottoms. When she starts, when she's rubbing her hand like this and her illustrators, he's, I think I can't tell if she's if she's matching or, or mirroring him. Mirroring is when you everybody's familiar with mirroring and they think they understand how it works um, to a degree. Most everyone does. Matt, when you mirror someone, if someone comes up and they're talking to you, have their arms like this. A lot of times people will come up and they'll automatically do that when they're trying to mirror them. That's not what you want to do. You have to be very subtle about this. Greg and I just did a whole video on this in body language membership, and it's just, and it's just blowing up in there. It's all anybody wants to talk about. So if you're a panelist that's in there, this is what we're talking about specifically. 
she starts as she starts rubbing her, rubbing her hand as an adapter. He's rubbing his lip as an adapter. So what she's doing, if she's the one actually mirroring him, she knows you don't have to do the same thing that person does every time. You be you're very subtle about it. She just sees him adapting and she starts adapting. So she looks she's trying to look a little bit uncomfortable as he looks a little bit uncomfortable when he's rubbing his lip. Um, what when when you and I'm saying that because you don't have to do the exact same thing that person does when they move their shoulder you don't have to move your shoulder just you can move your arm a little bit if they cock their head to one side you don't have to do that right away don't do it right away you have to take your time getting there you have to be subtle about it so they don't think you're making fun of them by mocking them or or or, or you know trying to make them look like like you're making fun of them. So Oprah is a master of this as she does that. She's trying to not coerce him into doing it, but the more she matches and mirrors him, like Mark was saying before, the more he's going to blend in and they're going to blend together and start going down that same road. As their as their brains lock up, which is called a, a brain sink, we'll, we won't go into into details of that, but that's what it's called. As, as they start going down together, that's what makes makes people get along really, really well. That's one of the reasons Steve Jobs, when he had meetings with him, he would take you on a walk and you'd walk around because you'd be walking with each other and you'd sort of get in sync as you walked. Matching and mirroring is, is a great tool for creating rapport with someone. You can do it very quickly if you know how to do it right, if you do it subtly, but get these things done. But it's very important. It's a very powerful tool if you'll get to understanding that. Yeah, so look, when it comes to mirroring, you've got a part of your brain which is over 5 million years old and it's designed to do that anyway. <laughs> like you're designed to mirror, whether you like people or don't like people, you're designed first of all to try out what we call limbic resonance in order to work out, is this somebody that I get on with or not? You're designed to copy their behaviors unconsciously to see, you know, to kind of try it on, see how it fits. And by trying on the behavior, your limbic brain, which is that five million year old thing, which is designed to quickly get you into groups by trying on these behaviors, it quickly goes, uh, trying on that behavior, it feels like you'd hold the same values and beliefs as me. And so most likely we'll help each other, we'll work well to, to, with each other. So you don't need to worry too much ever about, well, can I mirror people really well? Because you're going to do it anyway unconsciously the key is is could you speed up that process could you make that process uh, a little bit more adept and also could you actually maybe when you've tried on some behaviors and they feel odd and your instinct goes ah i don't think i'm going to get on with this person can you actually go you know what i'm going to try and get on on purpose and actually get deeper into this so I can see whether this is a fit or not. That's what we call working on a relationship because otherwise you'll only be living in an echo chamber of yourself. And now we're going to get on to baselining. So Greg, why don't you talk about baseline a little bit since you're the alpha of the baseline. No, so Chase, called, Chase says I'm obsessed, which I think he's right with baselining. But the truth is all body language people fall into two categories. Your baseliners, and there are absolutists. And absolutist says he scratched his nose, he's lying. You look this way, it means that. What most of us are, are is we're baseliners. We're looking for deviation. We're looking for change. And that can include a, a plethora of things. I'll tell you that I listen for choice of words. I'll give you a great example. I once knew a woman who was a waitress in a restaurant I went to, and she used a word that was way out of her vocabulary. I mean, just not her normal vocabulary. Not that she was not smart, just out of her vocabulary. And when I started poking and prodding, I realized that she was going to work for someone else soon. And that word came from that person. They had used a word that she had not heard. And so she picked it up. So I listen for deviation in words. I listen for something that's different. I listen for pitch, tone, and cadence. Pitch is really easy. There's a guy named John Lovitz who has made an entire career out of one joke. And that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he lies, that's pitch. When your voice changes, I notice. Cadence. When you change your speed, you'll see it when someone slows down to navigate a topic. It means something. When they speed up, it means they're avoiding something or they bypassed it. And then tone, in terms of voice, everyone can finish this sentence, so don't have to explain. It's not what you said. It's how you said it, right? So tone changes mean something. We look for deviation in that. Then we're going to look for deviation in those big five that we talked about in the last section that you use for body language. If I always do this, it means nothing. But if I suddenly do this, it means something. And baselining is no more than looking for deviation from what you usually do. 
You can look really odd and still be truthful. But if suddenly you stop lo looking really odd, it's an indicator. Baseline is that simple. And you guys are gonna add a lot of nuance to that and we'll go from there. Uh, Chris Watts, W-A-T-T-S. Wow. What, what's going on right now around your house? Right now it's got K-9 units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like, they're, they're doing their best right now to figure out like if they can get a scent and see where they went. If they went on foot, they went in a car, or they went somewhere. And right now it's just like they've they've been on point. They're going through the house trying to get a scent, and hopefully they can pick something up to where it's it's going to lead to something. Yeah. So let's talk for a minute about baseline because I've watched this guy. There's actually another video of him before he gets in trouble in 2012 talking about how to maintain a strong relationship and not screw around on your wife and that kind of thing. Irony, whatever. But. He, what we notice is this is kind of an adapter for him. This I call it chained elephant, shifting weight from the right to left legs. Politicians do it when they're uncomfortable until they're coached. What we'll notice is that that will change frequency. It will get faster and maybe even shorter and faster as he gets more stressed. That's an adapter and a way to release nervous energy. It's a way of making the uncomfortable comfortable. That's all it is. So we talk a lot about fight or flight on here. So let me talk for about 30 seconds on what fight or flight is. Your brain is pretty simple. It's there to protect your body, the body being the most important thing to the brain at the moment when you're in, in a bind. So the amygdala, what happens when you first get stimulus is the thalamus in your, in your little brain sends a signal to the neocortex to say, hey, here's this thing going on. And at the same time, sends that signal down to the amygdala. And there's one on each side of your head and one's more responsible for positive memory, and one for negative memory, but it gets the first vote because that's why we're still alive, is if it mistakes a bear for a rock, you don't reproduce. If it mistakes a rock for a bear, well then, so what? And so the amygdala gets first vote and it decides whether you go into fight or flight and whether you run away. That's quite simply it. And then it dumps hormones through the adrenal cortex and other parts of your body to start it getting you ready to fight. And when it gets you ready to fight, it does a handful of things. It takes blood away from your skin, and it leaves it pale, takes blood away from your digestive and reproductive system, so mucous membranes dry up, and there's signals to each of those running down vagus nerves and that that affect your body. And then, of course, your blink rate increases because your eyes are dry and your eyelids are trying to wet them. And those are all things you can see from the outside. Now, it also causes you to try to make yourself comfortable because you're uncomfortable. Pupils dilate. There's other things that you really don't care about when you're watching somebody like their bladder expands so they don't know they have to urinate and that kind of thing. But all of those pieces are tied to your autonomic nervous system and are there to protect the organism and make you get out of the way or fight back. We are just joking about fighting earlier. There's an interesting piece. What it does to you is turn off your thinking brain. That neocortex now doesn't matter, so the amygdala is running the show. And it will start taking away that brain. And what's telling about this guy, and you're gonna see it starting right now, is when that happens, you lose language because that neocortex is your language friend. And when we talk about things like, Mark, you call them filler words, those can also become adapters, like, 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 uh, 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 uh. And when you run out of words, you start trying to make sense out of what you were saying. And we're gonna see that a lot. So we're gonna see him sway more. We're gonna see his blink rate increase. We're gonna see a bunch of things happen, but the words start clustering for those and you'll find where he's starting to tell you lies. About your grandson. He is the sweetest, kindest, most loving child. He's so smart. Um, he loves dinosaurs. He can tell you which ones are herbivores and carnivores and he puts them in the hibiscus trees and lets them eat. And he loves Buzz Lightyear and Woody and Forky. and. Uh, <laughs> he's got a really funny personality and he jokes about my name because <laughs> I'm his egg <laughs> this is exactly what grief looks like what we see in terms of her eyes going up that not only clears the tears away but again as greg was saying stops her going down and getting deeper in the emotion and isolating herself because she wants to clear the tears get out of the emotion so she can contact that audience and get the data across so she is very much forward into it you don't see this side to side you're not going to see any push away 
gestures of the questions. She wants the question. She wants to clear her, her emotion away so she can get contact with the audience and get help. We hear a list of things which are ascribed to the, the child, things he likes, not, not things he liked. So she's still, there's still hope for her that, that he's around and she's describing things which are really, really specific to that child, which suggests to me, this is, this is the psychology of grief as well. Think about when you or when others have lost somebody very important to them. Do you not in your mind start to list all of these kind of little details, you know, that only you would, you would know because that's where you locate the, the relationship directly with that person. So, um, you know, Chase might often talk about, oh, you know, they've dislocated themselves from the person. In this case, they've finally located themselves with that person. You couldn't get a more detailed map of exactly who this is and the relationship to it. Yeah, I'm his egg. That's a really, you know, who else in the world is going, yeah, but I'm his egg as well. Oh, anybody could be his egg. No, super, super detailed. So this is what grief looks like. And this is what grief looks like when you're also trying to manage getting the information out to an audience and getting that help. Really hard to, hard to watch, I think. Yeah, it's horrible. She's not good with cameras, so I apologize. But we were just like, for anybody that has any information, I don't remember a lot. But I did remember I was breaking up, you know, with the cops. But I know that if, if, if anybody's got anything, but any, any places that I could have gone, anybody, did you know who you are? Please, say, find him, please. It mean a lot. It mean everything to us. And that's... Family ain't the same without family. That's for sure. Anything else? That All relationships have weird body language. They're all microcultures, every one of them. But most relationships don't have the microculture and the expression of fear. When a person holds another person by the shoulders, typically it's comforting. This woman's arm is across her torso and locked up tight. I agree, I don't see grief in either of these people talking about a baby who is missing. Now, Mark, I'll give you an alternative, what I think probably he's saying. He's saying, I remember we were breaking up and we I think cops, he's editing as he speaks because he's cautious what he's going to say. But I did remember I was breaking up, you know, with the cops, but I know that if, if, if anybody's got anything. I don't think he's swift. I think he's just, or my dad would have said he ain't too swift. I think he's just rolling along and he's trying to tell a story and editing along the way. And he's probably saying, hey, him and his girlfriend, wife, whatever the relationship, I'm not sure. Maybe they were breaking up. I told the cops is kind of what I hear. Remember, I'm a deep South boy too. So I live in the world that's a little different. Then I also hear him saying, anybody who knows where I would have been, that sounds code to me, like I'm blasted out of my mind and driving around is what that sounds like code for me. So I think there's probably, he's starting this whole story about how it happened and he might not even remember how, it, who knows? I'm, I don't know enough details of the case, but I would, I'm, I'm always cautious to try to read too much into language patterning in cultures that are this odd, because this is, this is South Alabama or they call it LA, Lower Alabama. This is Lower Alabama. And this is a poorly educated guy and also appears to have a drug issue and anger issues. At one point, if I were stroking my wife's hair to make her feel more comfortable, it wouldn't be with my knuckles, for example. There's all kinds of signaling of threat in this guy's body language. You can't miss it. And then she goes into something that Scott and I call transfer immediately. Doesn't mean she killed the kid, means she's hiding something. And that hide, when we prioritize our our feelings, grief takes back seat if there's an immediate threat often, 
We're going to get our bodies out of the place and we can deal with grief later. And she covers her face and she starts to be emotional and kind of rocking. And that's what we call transfer, emotionally unavailable so you can't talk to her. You guys already hit on the fact that her body is trying to separate from his and he grips and pulls her back in. Guys, if you see this in a service station, wonder if somebody's being trafficked. Look, something is not natural about a man physically grabbing a woman and moving her body around. And that's not comforting. I'll just leave it at that and say, every time I see this guy, and all the family isn't family, he's trying to, he's trying to appear human and appear to be softer than he is, is what I see here. There are very few people that I see that I immediately think not a lot of value. This guy's one of them. This guy, I look at him and think, yeah, immediately, lock this guy up. We'll figure out for sure what happened. But he did something when I saw this. And yeah, is that is that a little bit of projection? Maybe. But there's enough stuff here to tell me that we'll figure out what he did. But this guy's done something. Scott, yeah. what do you got? I think, well, in this, throughout these videos, we're going to see behavior by her that says that that will show uh, I'm concerned, I'm not concerned, I'm, fe I'm afraid, I'm not afraid those types of things. For example, now we know this guy is an abuser already from the record he has. Now, if you watch when she when he when he first says she's not good with cameras, she looks up and smiles at him. And you're gonna think, wow, she knows she's in on this as well. Here's why I don't think she's in on this. When you deal with a narcissist, when you deal with an abuser, that person being abused wants to connect with that person because they, when they first met that person, they were connected to him. When they were dating, they were connecting. He was nice to her. He was love bombing her, in other words, firing off oxytocin, serotonin, and getting and that helps her bond with him. Now what they do is they cut off that oxytocin and that serotonin, those those good reactions and things, you know, those the the positive reinforcement. And when they do that, that person is is in a way addicted to that oxytocin and that feeling they have from that that abuser or that narcissist. And, or the psychopath, whatever, in whatever the case may be. So they'll do anything to make, to get some of that, just to get a drop of it, to look like a, a heroin addict would do anything to get, to get a hit of the drugs, man. But to get anything, they would, they'll, they'll, they'll try to get positive reinforcement from which gives them the oxytocin blast. That's what we're seeing here. We see that over and over and over. She can hardly lock eyes with this guy. Every time he looks at her, she looks away. And if he, when he's looking at her, he's looking over her head, and she's looking at him. And then when he looks at her, she looks away. These are these are classic signs of someone being abused. If you're an interrogator, this is how you step in and go, "Hey, man, let's separate. We got to keep them separated." I don't think they've been talked to yet with this because look at the way they're acting. They don't have a story together. They haven't rehearsed it. They've said, "Okay, here's what happened. Okay, that's what happened." which is what usually happens when people do something. They'll say, "Here, okay, here's what happened. Here come the cops. You sit there real still in the car, and the car cops come up, and you all tell the same story because you've heard the driver telling the story. And so when it comes to the, the guy in the passenger seat or girl, he or she tells the story. The guys in the back seat tell the same story. But when you separate them, you haven't got that story clean yet. That's when you start finding out what the real, who's really being honest and who really isn't at that point. All right, that's almost, I'm gonna stop there. I'm not proud that I just left my friend there to be slaughtered at the hands of two other people. I'm not proud of that at all. You understand, you look guilty here. I understand that everything, all of the evidence against me right now is very compelling. Chase, what do you got? I think, what, Mark, when you're talking about distancing language, she's saying at the hands of two other people. I just left my friend there to be slaughtered at the hands of two other people. Which is massively, massively removed from what's going on. Not when they were stabbing him, when they shot him in the head with the, with the gun or any of the other stuff. And it's not the attackers, the assailants, the murderers, the men, the people who came in the house. It's just the people. And anytime she says, I'm not proud, Whatever comes after it will be a piece of evidence that's going to make her innocent. It's going to be an alibi or a reason that she's evidence or a reason that she's innocent. And she's showing a willingness to reveal personal information. So this is a, a mini confession of sorts. And on the large scale of this, we might be talking to a guy who's accused of murder. And he said, look, I, I did not do anything that you guys are talking about, but I have some heroin 
Uh, it's in the ashtray of my car. It's parked in the parking lot outside. I've been meaning to tell somebody. I just wanted to come clean and let you know. On the lower scale, uh, a, a, a woman might be asking her husband, hey, what's this, uh, what's this app called Tinder on your phone? And, he, and the husband says, well, you know, I've been meaning to tell you, I downloaded a few weeks ago. I chatted with a few people. I thought it was a business networking app. But, uh, you know, I've been meaning to tell you something about that. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. And that's a mini confession. And another thing that we're seeing here is a well-rehearsed behavior. And there's some research on this that says they may be hiding true feelings or intent, sad, lonely, or anxious, but they know they're being observed and they want to give the impression of that as well. And this is called Extra Face, and it is in this book right here. <laughs> I'm still waiting for my copy to uh, Amazon to know, deliver it. I got through customs. I appreciate, I Come appreciate on, you Amazon. doing that, Chase. <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate you doing that. It's, <laughs> those things where I don't get to talk about those things as often as, as I would like to, but I'm going to yeah. start doing that more. At least you could have done with send me one. I don't. I think you've seen enough of you because look at that on the back. <laughs> saying, He's in the truth right. plane. You that is now, you should, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no other place to be. But the truth <laughs> All right. Sorry, but thanks, James. Well, what I listen for when when it's uh, when I first started baseline. As I like, as y'all have heard me use the term loping, where I talk about how someone lopes along as they're talking, almost like you're riding it. And when that thing, it gets, there's an abrupt stop or it starts to get weird, then I start listening for not only the, the sentence structure, but their vernacular. Has it changed? Are there, are there words they didn't use or words that are a little bigger than if maybe they're not as, as, as up to that point as smart as I would think they would be using larger words than they should be? I think that might make sense. So if they if they start trying to sound smarter, maybe they're trying to impress someone. Maybe they're trying they're getting ready to tell me something that they're starting to make up or a story they've heard. That's one of the things when, when I um, when I'm listening to someone, then I'll ask them a question and see how that changes. If it's an interrogation situation, then you as they as you get a hold of their vernacular, if you, as, as you know how that sounds, and you and you listen to their structure of their sentences. Where are their verbs usually? Where are their their nouns and their pronouns usually in there. They start with I a lot of times or they or where they start their sentences with. If those things start to change, that means there's something going on in the brain. That means there's something they're they're stopping and paying attention to what they're saying as they go along. And the loping has almost completely stopped. It'll just be this little, like a little jumpy emotion as you go along, almost squiggly. I don't know how to explain it any better than that. But those are some things I, I start, that I listen for when someone begins to talk or I start asking them questions be it at a party, be it at an interrogation, be it at, at someone I haven't seen in years. Just trying to find out where they are and how those, those three main things change, their, their vernacular, the words they use, their structure, where they, how they, where they put them in the sentence, and, and how they deliver them, how, in other words, how, how, if it lopes or not, or how, how, how they travel with it. And if it's one of those things where it doesn't lope, but it goes like this the whole time, if it changes from that, then something's up. It's something emotional for them or, or there's, some, there's an additive there somewhere uh, or the reason they're lying or, or maybe being deceptive or the reason they're, they're blowing something up or exaggerating or just that they're exaggerating. So those are the ones that, that I look for. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so just as Greg was saying there, what we're looking for is a general state that people are normally most often in so that we can... and, and to kind of give that a name maybe or, or have some specifics around that so we can tell when something has changed enough for us to think something may be of note. And here's what I look for. I look for tension in the body and I call it a tension state. And I'm just going to run you through the tension states that I look out for. The tension states may they have different meanings in different circumstances for different people. They aren't universal in what they mean. They are universal in that all human beings are able to get at some point through all of these states. Okay? So the first state I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to call it the beach. And what I'm going to do is loosen as much of the musculature as I can as I'm talking to you, but still keep my illustration going so it's it's me 
but I just don't have as much tension in my body right now. I'm going to call that the beach. Now I'm going to move to something where I'm putting just a little more tension into my body, and I'm going to call that a manager because I'm now managing my body. Okay, now I'm going to move it into something I call, is there a bomb in the room where the tension is raised? Now, all I'm doing to do this is just tighten as many muscles as I can right now. Okay, so I would have said uh, when we were watching Chase, for example, he was in a state of, is there a bomb in the room? That doesn't mean he thinks there's a bomb in the room. It's just a way of naming the tension state he's in, whereas Scott was a little bit more the beach come manager. So I can baseline them based on that vocabulary. Let me go back to, is there a bomb in the room? You see, I come a little more forward. There's just more tension. I've got tension in my muscles here, tension in my fingers, tension in my face. I'm now going to go to, there is a bomb in the room. So all I'm doing is putting more tension into myself, same kind of illustrators, but there's a, a, like a different level. And you'll notice you're already mirroring and you're mirroring the tension. So we can see how you might be able to manipulate an audience and the feeling that they're having just by staying in that state. I'm now going to go to the bomb has exploded and this is the maximum tension you can go to. It, it kind of hurts to do this and after this you go back to the beach like this and that would be quite a radical change so if i start off in the beach and then i go to the bombs exploded at that point you think okay something's up here either mark is really trying to push this point home or illustrate it in some, some way or he just got asked a question that he wasn't expecting. Now, look, it'll be more subtle than I'm doing now because I'm trying to explain the model to you. And you may see it just in the hands or in the face or in the chest or in the shoulders. But essentially what I'm trying to get through to you here is the model that I might use to get a sense of what's the tension in that human being. And therefore, can I name it in some way so I know when it might have changed radically enough for a moment to be notable, and that's where I want to investigate. So, tension states, that's often how I baseline. He had had several plane crashes and had really damaged himself in one of them, and I don't think he was ever completely right after, after that last crash. I was seeing behavior in him that just didn't make any sense, like, he could remember things from way back when he was a kid, but he couldn't remember where he was for the last five minutes. And one of our volunteers came to me and said that that looked like Alzheimer's to him. Maybe he doesn't know who he is. Maybe he doesn't know where to call him. The eccentric's a good word to use. In the beginning, she's describing the, the number of crashes, and she, she makes a a break in eye contact that's unusual for her baseline. And I'm just referencing the interview she's done. If you go on her Facebook page, she has tons of her own personal videos and breaking the eye contact in interviews is not something she does regularly. So she's mentioning the crashes. She makes a, I think a four and a half second break in eye contact. And then it breaks to her talking about her husband being sick it's a separate where she's not, it's the second half of that where it's a separate clip. And you can see very real movement in the chin boss, which is also called the, the grief muscle, which is this uh, chin muscle right here, which is grief or shame, according to Ekman, Paul Ekman. And so I thought that was real. That looked like real emotion that the chin boss is very hard to tighten without turning your lips downward. And it was present in that video. And Mark, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for just a minute. If I was telling the truth, I would also want you to believe my narrative. There was one report that a neighbor had seen you loading something into a vehicle. I haven't seen that report. Did you load anything into a vehicle? Or anything large? Some umbrellas. Some market umbrellas. Those are those, um, you know, the umbrellas on the stands that are eight feet in diameter or something like that. When did you do that? That morning. 
here's what I love about this is, is Diane Sawyer, because she's using the Colombo method here, which, which is confusion and innocence. There was one report that a neighbor had seen you loading something into a vehicle. So she's playing this character of, I'm terribly confused by what I've heard and just very innocent about my knowledge level uh, around, around this, to, to, to lower status and bait him in in order to give something of an answer. And he does comply because he starts just talking nonsense around this. But the first move there is lower status, confusion, innocence, brilliantly done. It's a great method if you ever want to use that, is, is don't come in with all the status, don't come in with all the knowledge, come in with not knowing and being very confused about stuff. And, and then here's what she does. She gives the question with that confusion and knowledge, and then she shuts up. She says nothing. Yeah. Now, a bit later on, you're going to see him get wise to that <laughs> because he gives her a signal uh, in one of the other in one of the videos coming, saying, "I'm not falling for that one again. Not falling for that one. You're going to have to complete. I will answer a complete question, but I'm not falling for that routine anymore." So. Uh, great, great from her. Brilliant uh, performance. Great to see him go uh, to anger there. There, that's what I got for you. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. All right, Chase, what do you got? I don't think she believes what she's saying here at all. One thing I've noticed, and I've, I don't think I've read this in any research, is that when someone is very insecure or uncertain is what that word means about what they're saying they will close their mouth immediately when they're done talking the lips will come back together i've never seen research on that so i can't cite anything maybe you guys can her hands are moving outward to protect the body so the body's forming a structure that's harder if just look at it this way if it's harder for a saber-toothed tiger to attack the person, you're seeing fear or insecurity, vulnerability, that kind of thing. Some kind of a threat is, is perceived there. And she's repeating the phrase, which indicates more uncertainty because she's not repeating it for the reporter. She's repeating it for herself to increase her level of confidence in what she's saying. There's no emotion here. And this is a perfect example for the punishment question. And the punishment question basically goes, what do you think should happen to the person that did this? Once we find him, of course, what do you think should happen to the person? And in the read technique, we're basically asking the person to determine their own sentence. And this is a very nervous time in that person's life when they have to determine what's gonna happen to me and I get to choose what's gonna happen to me. And in a maybe a sexual predator type of case, you might say, well, you know, this person's definitely ill, definitely an apology to the family, some kind of a therapy, but not jail time, but definitely some kind of an apology to the family. And in my personal life, uh, about five years ago, the, there's a three foot spill of chocolate milk on a white living room rug. And I go to ask my two kids who are seven and eight at the time, who spilled the milk and both of them denied it. So I separated them. I said to my son, I said, did you spill that milk on the road? He goes, nope. I said to my daughter, did you spill that milk? She said, nope. Then I said to my daughter, what should happen to the person that spilled that milk on the rug? And she said, Spankings, no more Xbox, no more Wi-Fi, can't access the internet anymore, can't go outside, can't play with my friends, nothing. And I went to my son and I said, what should happen to the person that spilled the chocolate milk out here? And he says, uh, no more chocolate milk in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> so it works equally well on adults as it does uh, to kids. And that's the punishment question <laughs> that works on stable children not <laughs> people who think hmm let me see <laughs> yeah when did you all realize what you were missing uh, i they they didn't i was home with my oldest my two-year-old and he was with 
CJ was with him and uh, he went to go pay gas at a gas station and realized that he was gone. And he let the police know and me know that he was missing. When, when, then, when, when she says, when did you all realize he was missing? They haven't thought that. They haven't, like I said before, they were in the car, whatever, said, okay, here's what happened. Blah, blah, blah. Here's our quick story and didn't get the details. And so when they, when that woman asks, the reporter asks that question, where did you realize he was missing? She has to lie about it, obviously, because she's got to come up with the time. And we all know, because I've talked about it a thousand times, when you lie, the brain has to do three things. First thing, first thing it's got to do is stop you from telling the truth. Hang on just a second. Make something up and then deliver it. And in the deliveries where you see most of the action in this, you see a lot of it when they're thinking it up. But the big stuff comes on, the hardcore stuff comes on in, in delivery. And that's all we're seeing in there. That's a, they're actually putting themselves in the liar's loop. They're sticking, they're getting ready to go down the, the uh, Greg and I have a thing in that in uh, the True Crime Workshop where uh, how you tear a lie apart and you can box somebody in fairly quickly if you use this loop. And they're putting themselves, without going into details of all that, they're putting themselves in this loop, uh, in, in the death spiral of a lie, almost right out of the gate with this. It's, I, don't, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have much else to say about that either. Chase, what do you got? Uh, she's all, all shame, very little sadness, and she's being abused at home. I would, I would stake my career on that, but, uh, this downward gaze that he's got with this bouncing movement is most likely an expenditure behavior. So he's just burning off excess energy. So he sees his biggest problem as I need to manage this stress, not display sadness, so he's seeing stress management as a bigger problem than displaying sadness. So that's taking over uh, his his physiology and and his CPU, his his brain uh, at that moment. And I think her fear of him is absolutely palpable uh, in in this clip right here. And this this gaze that he has downward is just planning, strategizing, and ensuring that she stays on story. And I think this is, you know, this is where we're starting to see that she heard that speech. She heard that speech of, we can't fix this. We can't go back in time. We're all going to go to jail. You're going to screw my life over. You don't want to be responsible for that, do you? That kind of, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff is, is, is hardcore. And I think she's trapped in several different ways in this video here. And uh, Scott, please show us a still on when this goes up. I want you to see this uh, on the very final frame of the video. And this glance that he has says a thousand words. This is disdain and careful observation of her is a horrible human being. So if you ever see something like this for your friends, ask him if they're okay when they're in private, take a look at this up. And sometimes all it takes is someone just to notice that and then ask the question, because a lot of people, you'd be very surprised, get into a, a relationship like that and feel like it's normal. And they feel like it's normal until somebody starts to ask questions about it and they begin to understand this isn't, this is not how everybody else lives. That's all I got there. What do you think? Where do you think he could be? Somewhere with... Not with us. And that's what... That's the important thing is that he is not with us and we need to bring him back to us. So... I can't... I can't say where he could be, where he might be, like... Because honestly, we... We don't know. At this at this point, we, we don't know. We can all we can do is keep searching and doing you know everything we've been doing, and we're going to continue to do it. Mark, 
Yeah, I, I agree that adding in that idea of hopelessness around searching, we saw it, I can't remember with who, um, but he was saying, uh, you know, I told the parents not to bother flying over because, you know, it's just, you, you can't find anything around here. It's like immediately putting in the idea that it is fruitless to even try and search. It's tough for me to steal man this one. <laughs> I don't think it's got anything really going for it. So I've only got, you know, a, a many of the negatives that, that people have already said. It's concern, not grief. The, these coming in here, mm. that's, that's concern, not grief. And, and even then the concern is static. Look how long it holds for. Now you might go, well, you know, the longer it holds, possibly the better the emotion is. No, emotions are really uncontrollable. They're transient. They kind of flow in, they flow out. Somebody who's having a real emotion, they don't seem to be in control of it, you know, or, or you'll see their body language uh, reacting to it early on or too late, or it's just uncontrollable. That's why a strong emotion, most human beings won't be able to hold a strong emotion for more than 10 minutes. That's why if you're angry with somebody, like go away for 10 minutes, come back after 10 minutes. It's like, I can't remember what I was angry about. It's too much impact on the body to have an emotion for a long period of time. Emotions are designed to get something done right now. So, so I'm not seeing a, a, a strong, real emotion in her. Now, uh, to, to, to Scott's idea there of, you know, what's the link between the two? I think there are some links between them, but there's some radical differences between them. And I think you're hearing it in the background right now. I think if you listen to the background, you've got your man there who is, who is chatting away there loud, fast, like we, we heard in his rapid um, delivery of, of what they've been doing, the jobs that they've been doing. What do you think? Where do you think he could be? Somewhere with... Not with us. And that's what... That's the important thing is that he is not with us and we need to bring him back to us. So I can't I can't say where he could be, where he might be, like, because honestly. Now contrast that to how comparatively relaxed this is. So often when you're reading body language, don't just look at the person, look at the other people around the person, the, the other rhythms going on, the elements around them, like how are they reacting with everything else that's going on around them? Listen to that stuff happening in the background and go, that's pretty different. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, We'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you. We miss you. Your girls need you. No questions asked. However much they want, I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you. I want you back so bad. I think he's confused about who to address, and he's not sure should it be a hostage story, should it be a runaway story. And there's eye blocking. We see this little eye flutter when he's saying, I want you back. And there's no sadness. There's no sadness here at all. And there's a head shaking during his affirmative speech. When he's speaking in the affirmative, uh, it's a data point. So don't think that that's, uh, that's something that, that's going to tell you some secret that somebody's lying. So with this, I'm going to give you four steps. If you've got a post-it note handy and a crayon, I'm going to give you four steps, the Chase Hughes four-step method for breaking down the videos that are going to come up. Number one. Where is the concern directed? Is it story, plot, innocent, innocence, that person's innocence, or the missing person's return or safety? Where is, the, where is it focused? Number two, are there moments of stress or fear associated with their guilt or associated with the missing person? Number three, is the information provided specific and directed towards finding and recovering the missing person? And finally, number four, is the sadness more visible or less visible than the stress? You ripped it up. Yes. Didn't you think it might be important to save it to show yes. the cops and the detectives? In fact, I am still being threatened yes. by these two people who allegedly 
committed this crime? Yes, and um, and I absolutely regret that these notes came within days of my arrest, and I think still that I was just very scared for my family. And it's only now that I'm speaking out about this because I just need to have faith that the Lord is not going to put them in harm's way because I decided to, to do obviously a little late but I decided to do the right thing and then tell what I knew because by you know the reason I'm sitting here is because I didn't do the right thing is because I didn't go to the police right away I didn't call 911 right away you know I didn't I didn't go to a neighbor's house if you watch the last one second of the video the last one second you'll see Duper's delight the left side of her face tightens up the cheeks raise up and the lower eyelids raise. And it is the quickest micro expression I've ever, I think I've ever seen uh, analyzing a video. I watched it a few times and I had my iPad uh, like, just like three inches from my face trying to watch it, but it's there. And Greg. Yeah, so here she's closing the loop. Yes, yes, yes. That yes, yes, yes in this case. I think she has made contact and she thinks this woman is bought into her. She's reeling her in is what she thinks. Now, she, if she thinks that, she clearly cannot read body language because I agree with you, Mark, right there. Disbelief is all over her face like, really? This is what you got? But she runs down this whole thing and then she does something I could not have imagined possible. She went from this chaff and redirect and all this to holy ground. Now she's become what I call a stancer, what we call a stancer in our true crime workshop case. It's remember stancer is a person who's going to take a holy ground stance as God is my witness. I didn't do that. Boom, 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 boom. She takes holy ground and she comes up. So now she's used stancer, trancer, romancer. She's used insulator. She hasn't used prancer yet, but she'll figure that one out yet. I'm sure because she's got lots of strategies up in that head of hers. You notice that this is really what I think you're seeing. She does an eye block and then makes eye contact again. That's the connection. She thinks now I've got this woman. And again, I think she's missing that this woman doesn't believe her story, but she believes that she's falling for it because it's worked for her so many times before. And what an organist, all of us, every one of us talking to you and you included are simply a creation of things that have been successful in the past. If you get your knuckles wrapped enough times, you don't do things unless you are into having your knuckles wrapped. But if you are rewarded for something, like you get candy every time you do something, it just becomes part of your repertoire. And it compounds and compounds and compounds. And to Chase's point, sometimes it compounds in very negative ways and into pathologies that maybe you wouldn't even know what all of them are. But when we talk about borderline personalities, those are close to pathologies and those kinds of things. Yeah. And if if you're at all interested in what Greg was talking about for what worked for somebody in the past, and this is how all of our habits are formed, whether or not you want to go to the gym more often or eat healthier, all of those things, it happens right around this spot right here in the brain. There's a little spot called the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens is a dopamine memorizer. It says, I did this before, it worked out, and I got some dopamine from that, so I'm gonna force the brain to do that again. And it runs dopamine through a channel right here called the ventral tegmental pathway, or the ventral tegmental area. And that goes back and forth in the limbic system and forces a cycle that even at the age of eight or nine, if a behavior worked, you're more likely to repeat it. Even at the age of 55, sitting in an interrogation room, you'll do the same thing that worked for you when you were young because of that little spot called the nucleus accumbens, if you want to go look it up. And it doesn't That's matter whether that was a bad or a good thing. Depends on whether you right. perceived it as a good thing. Well, you got his statement. Mm -hmm. What did he say? He said you had sex with him. Oh, you're shitting me. Four or five times. Where? Uh, I don't know all the details because I was skimming through all the stuff. And when I came to his. You're kidding me. Mm -mm. That's what he's claiming. That's what he's claiming. <laughs> oh my God. Everybody wants a piece of you. Jesus Christ. Or everybody claims to have a piece of you. One of the two. <laughs> you have a statement? Yeah. Yeah, we copied it. Send me a copy of that statement. Yeah. I'm dying to see that. I'll, I'll get it tomorrow. 
Was it a short statement, a long statement? About a page and a half. Okay. Handwritten. Handwritten? Okay. He didn't indicate where this great love affair took place. Yeah, but uh, Mike, I cannot remember it. So. Rather know now than later. I'll say. God, I'll say for sure. So I talked to Dave about Dennis, and we're going to rethink, we're going to digest the statements and then rethink as to how to approach it. Okay. All right. Jesus. All right. <laughs> In this instance, in most crimes, probably 90%, I made that up, but let's just go with it. In most crimes, the person doesn't know how much you know. And especially as a police officer doing an interrogation, this video, when you watch this video back again, now think of how and why the bait question is so deadly effective. That question that starts with, is there any reason that X, Y, and Z would have seen you do this, or one of your neighbors would have reported this. That question is, in my opinion, one of the most, probably top three interrogation techniques in the world, the bait. It, it separates senior interrogators from junior people who come in and blast out information that's not true and let you know they don't know anything to start with, right? It's the ask versus the tell, yep. I always add whatsoever. Is there any reason whatsoever? Because that, that takes it to the wall. Is there any possibility at all? When you go through there and then when you start talking about dna you know it'd be a reason that your dna would be in that room yeah and they start you and you say stuff like you know like your hair your eyelashes some spit when you were talking like you'd be able to find spit when they're talking and those eyes will get all big and they'll start listening so that, yeah so that's a, that's a potent tool there we hope you enjoyed the best of behavior tactics mark what do you think yeah, so here's what I always say. Uh, you've seen a lot of ideas today. If you've seen something that you know would work, you've seen it work, or you recognize it would really work for you, don't practice it, you know, in the bedroom in front of the mirror, or just practice it like a doctor practices on real people. The only way you can get really good at this is to start using it in real life on real people. That's how you get really good at nonverbal communication, whether it's kind of using it to influence or persuade or using it to check out, you know, how viable, how honest or truthful or not people are being. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely agree, Mark. There's a tremendous difference between I know about that and I can do that. Those are very different things. And all of us choosing a, a, a doctor or a surgeon, we're going to choose the experience over the person who's got all the knowledge about it every time. So please take these out into your life. Do them one at a time. Take it slow. But get these skills into your life. They're massively important to your ability to connect and communicate with human beings. Greg? Yeah, so not only do you need to practice these, but you need to integrate this into your knowledge set. Every one of us has a different knowledge set. And once you learn the same skills, you'll have a different skill set than we have because you'll apply it to knowledge from your past life. So give yourself permission to understand how it ties into other things. Just keep trying. When you make a mistake, come back and look. But be open minded that sometimes a mistake is a way to learn as well. Scott, what do you got? The best thing Matt want to do as well is come back and watch this again. Because there's so much stuff in here, it's it, it, it's hard to keep up with. I know, but like Greg was saying, everybody's got will have their you will have your different take on it than we do. We come from four different angles. You could be the fifth angle that this that everything comes from, and and Mark and Chase are right as well. These are things you can use every day. So come back and watch this again every now and then, just sort of keep up with what's going on. It it covers everything. All right, we good? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I guess I don't know.